Okay, welcome to some live coding as part of chapter six, Taylor and McLaurin se series, or uh, yet another way for representing functions. So the code here is a continuation from what we did in week four, live four three, and uh, week five, live five two. And uh, I want to introduce the two remaining type classes. I want to remind you the numeric instances of power series and then implement derivative series as yet another type to represent functions. So first, transcendental and algebraic. So we have introduced a number of type classes, additive, add group, multiplicative, mul group, and those build up the what we call a ring and a field. And then there are some other operations which don't fit in there, which require more from its type. And we will not talk much about them here. And they are actually not, these classes, the algebraic and transcendental here are not as, um, well, disciplined or, or specific as the others. They, we have just made a little bit example. So algebraic, uh, is for solving uh, polynomial equations and we only use the square root and the transcendental we've decided to go for pi exponential sine and cosine even though there are a number of other functions that could very well also fit in there but having those type classes and introducing them is useful because you will um, in the project in the course uh, you will have to use the transcendental type class and that, if we just take an example, sine of pi, now it defaults to real numbers, so it's almost, but not quite, zero. Um, exponential of 1, that's e, well, pi by itself, and the square root of 4, for example. That just shows the uh, examples. And if, if we want to know what, what is square root, well, it take tells us that it's a method of the class algebraic which also requires a to be a field and so on okay that was enough of that uh, first bullet then number two reminder of the numeric instances for power series so here i will um, walk through what we already implemented so it will be rather quick but just because we're going to implement a very similar data type below and you want to see the similarities and differences. So I defined first the, the new type poly A, which has a constructor P and then a normal Haskell list A. And uh, the evaluator is, it strips off the constructor P and then uses the L, eval L. Eval L, on the other hand, returns the zero functions or recursively uses eval cons to build up a polynomial evaluation. And if we try it out, uh, eval p of p1, 2, 3, that will be a function that should represent the polynomial 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared. If we evaluate that 1, we get 6, if we evaluate the 2, we get 17. You can, if we evaluate the 0, we get the 0 of the term 1. Okay, and then a generic value for the polynomial uh, x. So 0 constant and 1 as the coefficient in front of x is xp. And that's just here defaults to the integer instance. Okay, and then just at the end of the lecture, we said, oh, by the way, the data type poly can also, also be used for representing infinite lists or coefficients, what is called power series or formal power series. So here I give a type synonym that PS should be the same as poly. And then I can reuse the same evaluator almost, because if I call eval P, on an infinite list, it will take infinite time until it terminates. So then instead, I first define a helper function, tp, which takes the n first terms of the list and makes a polynomial from it. So this takes a power series, an infinite list, and makes a finite list of poly. 
So that it's the same type, but I'm trying to keep them apart by showing how take b uh, truncates the polynomial after n terms. And then the evaluator for polynomials is not a true evaluation function, it's an approximate evaluation function. It will take n terms and then use the normal polynomial, polynomial evaluator. So uh, if I do that for the eval p example here, if I use eval p s, then I will have to tell it how many terms. If I give it just zero terms, well, <laughs> it won't do much. If I give it one term, it will give the constant. Two terms, it's a first order approximation. And three terms, it's a third order. Now, well, uh, it was this one less argument, so it was not that fun then. This is perhaps more fun to see, look at. So I can, uh, if I evaluate it with the last example here with uh, one term, it's just a constant. With two terms, it's the constant plus x, which is then three. And with three terms, then it's all of the polynomials. So anything above three will be the correct evaluation. So this is truncating the polynomial. And, and it's not needed for polynomials, but it's definitely needed when you have this infinite series. Okay, then let's move to remember the numeric instances. So uh, we have, uh, if we put that at the top, um, instances for additive, add group, and multiplicative. And these instance declarations just give names, to bind the zero to zero p, add plus to add p, negate to negate p, one p, and mul p. And these are all defined in turn in terms of the list corresponding functions. So 0p uses 0l, 0l is just the empty list. 1l is the singleton list of 1. Addition is the helper function add l, which is in turn zip with longer, which will walk through the lists, add the corresponding component. So the first components are added, then recursively goes on until one list ends, in which case it leaves the other list. Um, multiplication is a little more complicated, but multiply by zero is zero, so the empty list represents the zero polynomial here. And then if you have a, a list with a polynomial with at least one coefficient, then you can scale the other polynomial with the first coefficient and then call yourself recursively after you put a zero at front. And now with these, uh, with these things in place, we can do things like xp times xp. That's 0, 0, 1 as coefficients. And we can combine these things, say plus 2 times xp plus 1. So that's a polynomial. Uh, also, actually, we, we should perhaps show minus as well. So 1 minus 2, 1. So we can can write things which look a little bit like polynomials. Notice xp here is just a bound name. There is no lambda expression. And still we get the representation here representing a function which we can evaluate. Okay, so most of these operations are straightforward. Zip with longer, you might have to think about and mal l do, is doing some recursive work here. Okay. Motivating examples, where well, we saw already two, one plus one. Uh, Pythagorean, that's a, a use case for this sine and cosine. So um, if we try to evaluate Pyth Pythagorean, you'll see, okay, it's a function from A to A. If we reply it to one, for example, we get one, but it's not because we send one in, it should always be one. So it's doing this on, this on doubles, so it will not be uh, exactly one always, but it will be close. And notice what it's doing. It's multiplying. This is using the function instance, not polynomials, nor power series. It's using the function instances for sine and cosine, and then adding them up and multiplying these as functions. Okay, another useful uh, example. So we have built two here. We can also have a use for factorials. We've seen it appearing often in math. So factorials here is a polymorphic list. So for any ring A, we can make a list of these 
A, and if we this this would be an infinite list, so let's take five for example from it from factorials. We can see it's one, one, two, six, twenty-four, and if we take ten, we get significantly larger numbers after a while. Uh, it's not a difficult definition. We have a helper function that says factorials from zero, starting with the accumulating parameter one. So fact n is sort of computing what the factorial is so far. And we return that as the first argument. So that's one. And then we continue with factorials from n prime, which is one plus n. So one step further on. And we remember what we had so far. We multiply the previous factorial by the n plus one here. So that gives this infinite list of factorials. We will use it later below. And then we also had this uh, example polynomial P1, uh, which just uses the x, the minus one, and then this exponentiation operator, which also, of course, can be used on, uh, I mean, we can take P1 in turn to the power of two to get higher exponents. Okay. Um, then we implemented derivative and integral, and we've used these uh, in the Jamboard for uh, actually by hand solving equations. But these were just as reminder definitions. First, uh, defer down to a list version, and for the list version, derivative, throw away the first component, multiply all the rest with a list not of factorials, but one, two, three, four, five, and so on, and that's the iterate. So here we can also check that. Um, take five of from one is one, two, three, four, five. Uh, integration is the opposite. It uh, recursively, uh, it, actually it's not defined recursively, but zip width is defined recursively and it will divide all the coefficients of the second list with one, two, three, four, and so on. So they are the inverses. We talked about that last time. Okay, so this was all um, a little bit of introduction and repetition of what we had before so that we can start getting down to the actual business of implementing derivative series. So in the Jamboard lecture parts, we saw how ordinary differential equations could be transformed from equations of functions to equations on power series, infinite lists of coefficients. And that the power series equations then could be solved step by step to obtain better and better approximations, so longer and longer lists of coefficients of powers of x. And uh, to get from a function f via the derivative series of f to the coefficients um, of the Maclaurin series expansion of f, that was also one thing that we saw how to do in the lecture. And here we will focus on the implementation of the core of this, the derivative series, which doesn't really have a a uh, clear name in the mathematics side. So the first of that is to explain what I used on the slide, the d all, the semantic part, and the der all, the syntactic part. So d all here, it's, uh, a, it's a function, it's a higher order function. So let's, let's use real as the example, and I'll just write r for real here to make it brief. So given a function from real to real, it returns uh, an infinite list of functions from real to real. So what is the list? Well, the first element is the function I got, and then the rest is a recursive call to the all with the derivative of the function I got. So this is on the semantic side, so cannot be directly implemented in Haskell. And um, as often before, what we then do is to try to do it on the syntactic side. So instead of capital D all, capital D for the derivative here, I want to do a lowercase der all for the syntactic derivative. So the specification for the syntactic derivative, it should, instead of working of functions from real to real, it should start with a fun exp. And here I've written it as a function to bool, but you, can actually, you can't actually put it in Haskell and run it because it would have to check equality of infinite lists. And infinite lists, well, they take forever to compare for equality. But let's see what it's trying to say here. So if you get an E, a syntax tree representing a function, and you call there all, 
the head of that should be this, the same syntax tree as you got in. Well, strictly speaking, we don't have to require it to be the same as long as they evaluate to the same. But let's be simply here, simple here. And, Boolean and, the tail of the dare all so should be dare all of derive e. So derive is a syntactic derivative computation, so another syntax tree. And the call to the same dare all function should be the result of the tail here. So that's another way of writing it, is that this is a homomorphism with one argument that their all transforms derivative to tail. So if you look what's happening here, their all when called on the syntactic derive is transformed to tail after their all. And that's the way this list is built up. I mean, remember that uh, the all of f is basically f f prime, f double prime, and so on. So it's an infinite list, and if you look at this part, f prime onwards, that is d all, oops, d all of f prime. So you can see that this is actually the tail of this whole list. So we can actually implement this there all, uh, just by returning the e and then calling it using the definition here. Uh, but notice derive is not a homomorphism, so we wonder can we do it better? Can we compute it uh, as a syntactic uh, homomorphism from the data structure of FunExp? And the answer is yes, and we will see how to do it below. Okay, but before we get to the actual implementation of the interesting cases, let's define now the data types for this case. First, it's a very simple data type. New type DSA is the constructor DS and then a list of A. So this is basically basically the same as poly and PS. So, but we define a new type because the operations will not be the same, or at least not all of them. And then if you want to evaluate one of these, well, the easiest way of evaluating it is actually to, because now the, the intention here is to, the list should contain uh, f of zero followed by f prime of zero followed by f double prime of zero and so on. All derivatives, all derivati derivatives of f evaluated at zero. Um, and if we want to convert that to a function, then the easiest way of doing that is to first convert it to a, a Maclaurin series. So that basically means divide all the coefficients by the factorial. So I will not go through that part here, but you might remember it from the slides um, or the, the Jamboard that we noticed that the only difference here was that we had to divide by factorials. So we can actually zip with division, the list of coefficients as a de derivatives list, a derivative stream and two power series. So they'll both have an infinite list or at least a list inside. And the only difference is that we have to divide all the coefficients by the factorials. And then of course we can also transform back. If we have a power series, we can multiply by the factorials and get the derivative series. We'll not dig into those uh, examples right now, but we will try to see what the operations should do. And first, we should implement der ds and integ ds. And here I will, I will briefly split and find der p to compare with. So we should have something of almost the same type. So let's put that in here. So there ds should also be of the same shape. It should take a ds to a ds. Um, okay, but how do we do it? If we have a list here, an infinite list, actually, let's, let's do the standard thing of undressing it. So there l, um, we, the problem here with DRL is that we already have a DRL implemented. So 
unfortunately, it's a little easier, so we, we can actually not name that function right now. So it's going to be a ds of and then some list. And the question is, what is that list going to be? Well, well, let, let's actually let's do a helper, but not we can't call it DRL because DRL is taken, so let's call it DRL D. Uh, so DRL D of AS, let's define that separately. So DRL D, and then now this is actually working on the normal Haskell lists underneath. So what should DRL D do? Well, if we get in our hand something which we can call AS, which has first an A and then an AS prime. Well, the, the naming here, the, the pattern means that AS, or it means that A is equal to head of AS and AS prime is equal to the tail of AS. And as you remember, we are working here with lists of derivatives. So the tail of AS is actually uh, all the derivatives. I mean, it's it's um, it's basically sort of it's almost equal to uh, dar ds of AS. It's just a type, which is the the mismatch here. So that means that the name AS prime here is not a random accident. AS prime is actually the derivative of AS. So I just need to return it. So this implementation oops, um, of DRD doesn't actually require any constraint here. It's, it's just from list to list, um, and meaning this is, doesn't have any constraints either. And uh, well, it's you could say it's a little bit of cheating because we've said that, okay, we already have an infinite list of the function and all its derivatives, then clearly de taking the derivative is just stripping up the first element. So basically, as we can see, this first element is not used, so we just throw it away and keep the rest, and that is the derivatives. Now, if we, if we compare it what the derivative was doing here, had it, we actually had to uh, multiply... Oh, let's get rid of this one. Uh, here we actually had to multiply all the coefficients with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. But in this representation, we're keeping the derivatives uh, as they are. We're not multiplying them by anything. So it's easier. It's a constant time operation to compute the derivative. Well, given that we already have computed them. Uh, so we have to be a little bit careful here if we want to try. Um, so let's uh, open this one and see what happens if we now compute the derivative of xp. Okay. XP has the wrong type. Let's implement a version of XP, which we call XDS. So that should be a DS of A. And it actually also needs a constraint, but let's add that later. So XD is a DS of, well, here we need, a, we can put it this way, a, a list which whose first uh, component is, let's put it in comments first, the first component should be the identity functions at value at zero. The next component should be the identity functions derivative evaluated zero, and then the identity functions second derivative evaluated zero, and so on. And uh, we know that the identity function evaluated zero is zero. The identity functions derivative, that's actually const one, at zero, which is one. Oh, we should say here actually zero and then one. And then, well, all the rest will all be zeros. So we can actually write zero as the rest. And notice if we do that, um, the zero here is no, is not a, um, um, oh, we should have zero L. So zero Oh, I haven't implemented zero ds yet. Okay, let, let's let's do that first. Then. So zero ds should be ds of a, and zero ds is actually the empty list inside a ds. Oops. Okay. Uh, yeah, zero ds is. 
Now this is unnecessarily chunky perhaps, but okay. So 0ds is in ter defined instead of terms of 0l. Oh, by the way, 0l we already had defined upstairs. And in this case, it actually is the right one. Okay, so we don't have zero or multiplicative, so we have to put, well, the simplest is just to say ring here. Okay, now we define an x for the rings, and we can actually simplify it, simplify it slightly if we also define one here. So 1ds, what is 1ds? Well, it's ds of 1l, um, which is the same as the, oh yes, and that one also needs a constraint. So this one needs multiplicative a, and this also then needs multiplicative a. Ah, okay, it also needs add. So let's just, just keep it reasonably simple by, uh, by using a ring as the requirement in most of these places. Okay, uh, so we've now implemented 1ds and 0ds in terms of the 0l and 1l, and we have to be a little bit careful that they are the correct thing, but actually if we, if we think about it, it should be the constant function returning 1 evaluated at 0, the constant function uh, returning one's derivative at zero and so on and all of these the only the, the first one is one and all the others are zero the derivatives are all zero so that means that if we check here what is one l it's the correct value even for ds um, okay now we should be able to evaluate x ds Okay, so S xds is some value of ds type and it doesn't print it because we haven't supplied a show instance. So let's require that. Deriving show. Okay, good. Uh, now we should be able to finally look at what xds is. So xds and xp are actually the same um, well, in, internally, it's represented by the same two values, but it's not actually um, going to be the same when we go into higher definitions, xp prime and xds, uh, xp squared and xds squared will be different. Okay, but anyway, the derivative for ds is, has a helper function there d, and we've said it's just a tail, so let's check if there ds of x ds is what we expect it to be. Well, that's representation of constant one, so that's fine. And if we take the second derivative, it's zero. So that seems fine. The only problem here is that we may, I mean, if we if we take the next derivative, if we keep take keep on taking derivatives, we would say exception, non-exhaustive patterns in function there d. So we actually also need to define there d if the list is empty. But the derivative of an empty list representing zero is zero. So now we can compute all the derivatives of xd. Okay, so we implemented here um, the dad ds, we should also implement the integration. And we had integ p, and there we had to implement, so we will do something of a similar type here. So uh, get down here. So integ p renamed to integ ds should now take a constant because at the same kind of operation we need to insert a constant because the derivative has sort of thrown that part away. Uh, so the constant c and a ds of some more coefficients some derivatives, um, that should be an integ, well, we did find a helper function here, integ d. So integ d is not the same as integ l, so that's why I'm using the, the d name here, c and cs, 
an intake D. So then just take lists here instead. Oh, it's not quite that. I need to put the constructor back on top. And then the question is, okay, what is this one? And now I will split the window to see the evaluator as well. Now it complains yeah, because I haven't finished the definition. So with a constant C and an infinite list potentially of continuations, it should put this um, derivative first and then insert the rest. So oh, let's make this the full window and then, whoops, reload it. So let's see what integ ds is doing. So I want to integrate x. Okay, now it's not quite clear what type I want this to have. So let's say that this is a ds of real. Oh, uh, so yeah, that's why it was confused. So I need to put a constant as well. So say one. So I want to integrate x and um, I want to compute, uh, I want to have the derivative or the value at zero to be one. That's the, the new constant I added. So the constants, so C, C here is F of zero. And CS are all the derivatives. So of, clearly if, if we integrate a function, then that function and all those derivatives should be the derivative, which is the tail of the result. So clearly if we now test this, we should get back xs, xds. Hmm, der ds. So you can see this is the same as xds. And if we had some more exam more complicated example, that should also work out. So if you notice here, uh, derivative is basically just take the tail and integration is just insert the cons constructor. So these two operations are trivial now in this representation. They don't have to do any work, whereas the other one had to zip with uh, uh, increasing list of number or zip with a division of the increasing list of numbers. So that's a, a bonus of this representation then. Okay, finally we start getting to interesting operations. We've, we've implemented x, um, 1, 0, and now we should get to multiplication and addition. So addition first, that's really easy. So if we have two ds things, as and bs, we should get an add l of as and bs. And add l is the same definition as we had for add p. So notice here, add p also just took away the constructors and called add l and it zip with longer addition. So that's because derivatives are linear. So let's see, additive, yes, okay. The type signature here wasn't right. We actually need to require additive of A. It wasn't completely sufficiently constrained. Okay, uh, so now I should be able to write an instance declaration because at this point I've got both zero and add. So instance additive, um, if A is additive, then I should be able to say that ds of a is additive, where 0 equals 0 ds and addition equals add ds. Okay, um, could not just use add group from use of 0 ds. Ah, um, let's see. I, I was a little too strict on the requirement on 0 ds here. So I re required a ring. So let's uh, let's weaken that to just additive. Okay. So uh, now we can write things like xds plus xds, being well, <laughs> 
2 times x. Okay, so that was addition. And then the most inter interesting operation here is actually multiplication. Um, and uh, for multiplication, let's start with some wishful thinking, also called the induction hypothesis. We want to call this, um, we have, can assume that the two arguments already satisfy the desired predicates, so the specification of their all and so on. They, they, we can think about the two arguments as being the result of calling their all on some terms, which means that they will contain something of this shape. So, oh, okay, let's let's define first the, the trivial part. So, uh, AS, DS, BS is DS of mal D, AS, BS. Mal D because it's not quite the same as mal L from above. So, mal D, uh, list of A to list of A to list of A. So, mal D should take two arguments, fs and gs. And I've used this pattern syntax in Haskell that, so fs is the name of the whole, name of the whole list, and its head is f and its tail is fs prime. And as before, we know that fs prime is representation of the derivative of fs. Similarly, gs prime is representation of the derivative of gs. Oh, and it should be mal capital D there. And the result should be, well, the head should be some m, m for multiplication, and the tail should be some ms prime, where, and then we just have to fill in uh, some values for these two definitions, ms prime. First, let's check the types, okay. So, first of all, we know that the first component should always be the full function value. So uh, here it's the multiplication of f and g. So it's actually just f times g. Okay, and now of course uh, I haven't said what context this should be here, so I will need at least multiplicative and I will use ring as this context. Okay, then it worked. Uh, still, of course, I lack the derivative here. So I need to compute the derivative. But the nice thing is that we can at least guess. We can say, well, if we want to compute the derivative of a product, that it ought to be something like f prime times g plus f times g prime. But f prime here, that's actually fs prime. And g is actually, I mean, th this to, to be type correct, both fs and g have to have the same time. So this is gs. And this, um, this f here is fs and this g is gs prime. So then, then this must be multiplication. Let's, let's take it step this must, must be multiplication of lists so this is actually a recursive call to mal d of fs prime and gs and this is a recursive call to mal d of fs and gs prime and this also gives back lists which means that this addition is actually an add l of these two arguments okay let's see if this type checks Yes, it seems a type check. Um, so what is it doing now? Well, it's calling recursively itself. Mal D is calling itself recursively. And, and then we have to always be a little bit careful and see, does it call itself on smaller inputs? So FS prime here, well, that's good. That's one element shorter. It doesn't have the head F. And uh, well, the other one is the same size, but at least one is smaller. And then here as well, fs is the same, but gs prime is one element shorter. So that should uh, be productive in the sense of going further and further off in the lists. But we may be a little bit uh, worried about what ha happens with the empty case. So let's uh, try to see what, what that is. So if we do mal 
ds now of say xp and xp. Uh, I don't sure what, what maybe I need to reload this one or kill my e session and restart it. So we want to compute x ds, so mal ds of x ds and x ds. And then it says zero, zero exception. Well, non-exhaustive patterns. I need to also cover the other cases. So mal d, well, if we multiply an empty list representing zero by anything, it will actually be zero. Zero times anything is zero. And similarly, if we multiply anything by zero, so it's symmetric here, then it will also be zero. So then we can see, ah, yes. So now, is this what we expected? It's 0, 0, 2. Notice if we do mal p of xp, xp, we get 0, 0, 1. So what's the difference here? Well, in the mal ds case, we're storing derivatives. So what is this is saying is that x squared, uh, th this should be the value of the function of, of if we take the first the, the function lambda x to x squared, evaluate that at zero and followed by the function derivative at zero. So that's the function lambda x to two times x at zero, followed by the function lambda x to two at zero, followed by and so on. Everything else here will be zero. So notice that this is actually, uh, if I put it over here instead, um, this is the same as the function uh, x squared at zero, that's just returns zero. The two x returns also zero, but the constant function two here will return two, and then it will be zero, which is, as we said, an empty list. So 0, 0, 2 is the correct answer for the multiplication of xds and xds. Its deriv second derivative uh, is 2. Okay, so that seems to work. Let's uh, put it together by an instance declaration. So we had an instance now for additive. Let's make an instance for multiplicative. Multiplicative ds of a, and then it's 1, which would be 1 ds, and multiplication, which would be mul ds. Okay, and now I should be able to do x ds, say, to the power of 5. Okay, not the right operator. Okay, and now we see here, if I take it to the power of 5, the derivative will actually be at the fifth position, position 120, because that's 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Or also, if we look at the factorials, uh, say take 5, or yeah, take 5 of the factorials. Oh, it starts at 0, so take 6 of the factorials, we'll get the, the 120 there. So this can also be visible there, the difference between x ds uh, to the power of 5 and xp to the power of 5, where we only keep the components of the coefficients in the polynomial. But here it's the derivatives which are stored, and that's bigger. And you see the relation between them is the factor of the factorial. Okay, uh, I will not spend time right now in computing and in uh, implementing the other operators like division and, and subtraction and so on, but they have similar definitions. But interesting thing to note is that we have, if we go up to the start here, introduced two type classes. We looked over the previous implementation of power series and we sort of mimicked it to implement derivative series. And the fact that we can implement these things in the type classes means that we can work directly with these values um, uh, at the command line without having to create a syntax tree. So notice I haven't used funexp here. I could use it, and there is actually also an evaluator from the syntax trees to this derivative sequences, just as there is a one uh, to the um, power series representation. 
And what we also, uh, well, we haven't proven perhaps, but we have uh, shown that we can implement MALDS, which can be used to implement uh, as one of the cases, the MALT, the eval, the, no, the dare all. Maybe I should just give the dare all case as well. I think, I think I had the start of it here. Ah, okay. Uh, okay, let's just define it. So their all should take a fun exp to uh, one of these ds a, and it will require then this to also to be a ring, and we'll just define a few cases here. So their all of x, that's the x ds. That's already type check it. Oops. Uh, seems fine. And there all of f times g is, well, it's a recursive call to there all on f times, because I've now made the mul instance, a multiplicative instance, there all of g. And now I can check if there all of x colon star colon x. Well, notice this will be now an infinite list, so I will have to take. I don't have a take ds. Uh, okay, let, let's do it this way. ds of as equals this. And now I can take five elements of as. Well, actually, it didn't need five elements. It ended after a few. But as you can see, uh, this definition, this line here, makes it very clear that we have a homomorphism, that their all is a homomorphism from multiplication to, well, the multiplication. But the multiplication, the second multiplication here is implemented by mal ds. And similarly for, for the other cases. So given that we can provide instances for these, the means we can also define a homomorphism there all, which syntactically goes down recursively into all the subtrees and then just combines them with the proper operators. Okay, that was all for this session.